There no longer stands a German line in the West. Instead, American, Canadian, and British troops drive forward on almost every sector, enveloping small pockets of resistance and crumbling hedgehogs. These films were the last ever made by a courageous man, Gaston Madru, who was killed by enemy fire immediately afterwards. After a bitter fight, the great city of Leipzig falls. The radio station is taken intact. The intricate equipment, which it might have taken the Allies months to replace, stands ready for their use. Farther south, Nuremberg, smashed, death-ridden, and in Allied hands. It was in Nuremberg, the holy city of Nazism, that each year before the war, a great party rally was held at which Hitler spoke, in the stadium built by the Nazis for this very purpose. Now it is empty. An American soldier stands where Hitler stood. A German soldier who will never listen to any more speeches. Major General Feit, German commander of Brunswick, surrenders to his American captor, Major General Hobbs. And in Brunswick, a camp for British officer prisoners is overrun. Riotously, 2,200 of them greet their American liberators. Food and cigarettes are the order of the day. While at a camp to the west of the Rhine, German troops from the Rohr pocket stream in in ever-increasing numbers. 75,000 was the count at one time. Some old men, some children, and large numbers of fit young soldiers. A Czech who had spent six years in a concentration camp was sent through to ferret out Gestapo men. On his arms, the Germans had tattooed his prison number. In the great drive through the heart of Germany, 12 German generals were captured by American troops. One, though retired and in civilian clothes, surrendered voluntarily. Here is the backbone of the German army. In central Germany, troops of the Third Army uncovered Germany's gold reserve hidden in a salt mine. Gold and foreign currencies worth millions. And art treasures from German museums, stored here for safekeeping. Rembrandts, Raphaels, Leonardos, and a Renoir. It is not yet decided what shall be done with them. The town of Stendal formally surrenders to the Allies. Civilians are registered by military authorities. Ration cards are validated. Housing is made available by requisition. The town is put into working order. Crowds gather in the marketplace to hear Allied orders, to read the Allied proclamations disbanding the Nazi party, Nazi laws and institutions. Civilians, conscious that they are thoroughly beaten, obey readily. Uniforms are turned in. Post-war Germany will have no armies. Arms are surrendered, pistols, swords, daggers, sabers. They will be destroyed. And meanwhile, the British and American armies surge on to their junction with the Russian allies. Magdeburg on the Elbe. The garrison commander rejected an ultimatum to surrender, and so, with the air forces leading the way, the city had to be bombed and shelled into submission. When the pilots had done their work, tanks and infantry move in across the freshly plowed fields, down the dusty roads, from every side, and an overwhelming force. Magdeburg is captured, and Allied armor fans out north and south, moving at ever-increasing tempo. And at Torgau on the Elbe, 
the great junction is made for which the world has so long waited. And now, the British, the American, and the Red Armies begin the last battles with a common front in a broken and dismembered Germany. At the castle of Aaron Breitstein at Koblenz, a ceremony was enacted this April which seemed peculiarly fitting and just. On Army Day, after Generals Bradley, Patton, Simpson and Hodges had inspected troops drawn from every army on the Western Front, an American flag was raised on the castle ramparts. It was the last flag ceremoniously taken out of Germany in 1923. Since then, it has been kept in Washington. Now brought back by special plane, it is the first American flag officially to be hoisted on German soil. General Bradley told his troops, today in victory, Americans acknowledge with gratitude the sacrifice and hardships of their allies. The flag here raised is a signal of triumph and a banner of hope, the hope of United Nations that this time its significance shall endure. German concentration camp at Buchenwald. Ten British MPs have come to see for themselves. They came to see the whipping block, to talk with the living, to look at the dead, See the cremation ovens the world did not believe existed. Belson, a camp for political prisoners. They starved. They died. They rotted. This is Joseph Kramer, Commandant of Belson. He is under arrest. Here are the women guards. Gestapo guards. They are led away under arrest. At Stalag Tekla near Leipzig, a few prisoners of war escaped from the mess hall in which they were locked at the approach of Allied troops. The building was set on fire, and as the prisoners ran from the burning building, they were machine gunned or were electrocuted and burned on the barbed wire of the fence. In the Rathaus at Leipzig, there were guilty consciences that dared not await the justice of the Allies. The mayor and his family and the Volksturmer general had made their own escape. They took poison. Perhaps Hitler for once was right. The memory of this Reich may last for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. 